Welcome to this month's Conservation Conversations. I'm Sean O'Brien, the President and CEO of NatureServe. I'm really excited this month to actually have one of our staff members on the show. His name is Mike Gill, and he is the Director of the Biodiversity Indicators Program here at NatureServe. And we're going to talk about that some during the show so you understand what that means. Uh, Mike is an honorary fellow of the UN Environment's World Conservation Monitoring Center, which is a very exciting organization that we work with. And he was also the former co-chair of the Group on Earth Observations Biodiversity Observation Network, which is called GeoBon, uh, which is a group that we work with and uh, is very exciting because NatureServe is all about uh, biodiversity observation. So GeoBon is a, is a good organization for us to be affiliated with. Um, Mike has partnered with Aboriginal, national, and subnational governments, academics, and industry, and NGOs in his work trying to improve the state of uh, biodiversity in the world and coming up with ways to measure how we're doing at conserving biodiversity. Mike is the uh, co-author of over 60 scientific publications, books, and book chapters. Uh, and one of the things we're going to talk about in the show, uh, one of the things that's most interesting about Mike is the amount of time that he has spent uh, by what most of us consi would consider to be the middle of nowhere. But I understand from talking to Mike and other people in the Nature's Network is actually one of the more spectacular places on the planet, some of the remotest parts of Canada. And uh, he's making me want to go there. And hopefully after hearing him talk about it a little bit later, you'll want to go there. But really what you're going to have the opportunity to do is learn about the Conference of Parties conversation that happened in Canada in the past couple of weeks, where they were talking about the Convention on Biological Diversity and the work that's being done really globally to protect biodiversity. But before we get started, I want to remind you that NatureServe is a nonprofit organization, and we rely on your support as a listener to make donations to NatureServe to support our work. You can make donations through our website at natureserve.org. Uh, you can make ordinary donations. You can make a monthly donation. So with that, we'll get started. Thank you. Well, Mike, you have just returned from the 15th Conference of Parties, uh, which sounds like an amazing thing to get to go to, but I think it's not quite what people are thinking. So tell us, what is the Conference of Parties? Yeah, you're right. The Conference of Parties, Sean, is definitely not a party, in, although they did play the World Cup in the background, which was fun to watch it with various nations. Um, but what the Conference of Parties is, is just UN speak for regular high-level meetings um, for the various UN conventions. So the Convention on Biological Diversity has Conference of the Parties every two years hosted by a different country. And that was the 15th one. Um, they're always important, but this one, it was incredibly important simply because we, we saw the adoption of a new deal for nature, a new global biodiversity framework agreement. So what does that mean, um, a new framework agreement? And of course, backtracking a little bit, the conference or the uh, Convention on Biological Diversity, needless to say, that's something that NatureServe and you and your role uh, here at NatureServe are really interested in. So talk a little bit about what the Convention on Biological Diversity is and then uh, transition over. Sure. So, so the UN Convention on Biological Diversity is one of the three original, what they call Rio conventions. So, so way back 30 years ago, uh, we had a, a, a Rio convention on, on, on environment in Rio de Janeiro. And out of that from world leaders came these agreements, um, three of them, Convention on Biological Diversity, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, and something called the UN Convention on Combating Desertification. And these agreements were broad-based, legally binding agreements um, that basically set the course for how we're going to address those individual crises that the world were facing. Um, the UN Convention on Biological Diversity has been ratified by 196 what they call parties and parties are not parties in the how you and i might know them these these are typically governments so there's 195 nations plus the european union that have ratified that agreement and, and is there they, anyone who hasn't ratified the convention on biological diversity? yes yes there is there's two actually hmm. so so the united states signed it so bill clinton actually signed uh the convention in 1993 but it never actually passed through and became law 
the other entity is what we call the Holy See, so the Vatican. Um, but they typically don't sign on to conventions like this. So, so it is a big hole to not have the U.S. there. But having said that, the U.S. plays a pretty darn important role in the background in, in this convention in particular. And so that's that's good to hear. And of course, um, right now things are happening in politics in the United States where uh, you know we're talking about 30 by 30 in the form of what we call America the Beautiful here. And so in many ways, we're pursuing goals that are in the convention uh, without having had the, the treaty ratified by the by the Senate. Absolutely. Absolutely. The, the, the fact that the 30 by 30 really came about through what they call goal A, which was around protecting and restoring ecosystems. And that inspired action already. And, and that's that's definitely had a big impact um, in the United States. So the United States, in many ways, even though they're not a party to the agreement, they're following suit. And, and I think they're aligned in many ways to what we're trying to do in the rest of the world. So while it's really gratifying to see all these countries come together and agree on things and talk through challenging issues like this, what what was the actual like result? What what has changed now and what will be different in 10 years because of this meeting? So so well, I, I have to say it's I'm I'm actually amazed at, at what we walked out of Montreal with. Um, partly because the UN operates under consensus. So you had to have 196 parties agree to every single words of a new global biodiversity framework. And that meant meeting literally meetings through the night we had meetings that went till 3 a.m we had a meeting that went till seven in the morning and in some ways you could you, you might think that maybe we got agreement through exhaustion um but it's actually quite incredible and i think about it like when i was a kid at christmas and you really wanted that toy but your parents were saying you're not gonna get it there's no way you're getting that toy and and then it's Christmas morning, you open the present, and there it is. And that that's how I feel about this agreement. Coming into Montreal, the countries were wide apart on, on three major issues. Uh, there was huge disagreement. So the fact that we even got a deal at all is incredible. But the deal is actually a really ambitious one, and it's really well formulated. And so we're, we're well set to, uh, for action. That is super exciting. And I actually have the agreement open in front of me, the uh, the draft agreement, and it lists all of these various targets um, of which there are, what, 23. And uh, several of them feel very relevant to NatureServe and to the people who care about what NatureServe does. Um, so I don't know if you have them committed to memory, but uh, obviously target two, where we ensure that by 2030, at least 30% of areas of degraded terrestrial inland water and coastal and marine ecosystems are under effective restoration. And at the same time, ensure and enable that by 2030, at least 30% of terrestrial inland water and coastal and marine areas uh, are effectively conserved and managed uh, is really exciting. So talk a little bit about what those what those mean. Yeah, so th those are really core elements of this agreement. And actually, if we can achieve those targets, a lot of the other targets kind of almost by by proxy fall fall into place. So this the, we call those spatial based targets. Um, so uh, we have targets around restoration, around conservation, as you mentioned. We have targets around restoring and maintaining genetic diversity, uh, halting and reducing loss uh, extinction rates. Uh, as well as protecting key biodiversity areas. And NatureServe occupies all those spaces. Um, we have the best data in North America uh, to, to, to really inform a, a spatially optimized approach to that, because it's tricky. You've, you've got people uh, on the landscape doing very legitimate things, agriculture, forestry, and so forth. So how do we thread the needle? How do we use evidence-based data? to to basically optimize land use allocation for conservation restoration but at the same time maintaining uh, livelihoods um, uh, reducing poverty increasing food security not just in north america but around the world but i think it's doable yeah and i like um i like a lot of the things that you said there but uh, in particular you mentioned evidence-based or science-based decision making and that's one of the things that's so exciting about 
what we have available to us in North America is we have this amazing spatially explicit database on biodiversity, both uh, species as well as habitats. And both of those are important in this conference parties agreement. Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah. So this is this is the core. These are the core ingredients in the recipe by which we're going to achieve those targets. Um, and we need to understand sort of distance to target. We need to use data uh, to produce what we call indicators, which are just it's kind of like when you're driving your car and you've got your dashboard and your speedometer. How fast am I going or your GPS is telling you how far away you are and how to get there? That's the same approach that we're taking with the implementation of this agreement is we need to use evidence-based data and indicators to guide progress and measure distance to target. Um, and that's something that that we've learned a lot from, mostly due to our failures. So if you look back to the last decadal agreement for nature, what, which created what they called the Yachi biodiversity targets, we, we, we didn't reach any of them. All 20 we failed to fully reach and many we went backwards. And NatureServe actually asked why, why is that? Like, what are the reasons? Um, a simple question, but a complicated answer. And, um, and we've used those answers to actually really help formulate this new agreement to learn from our mistakes and, and chart a better path going forward. So that's actually a super exciting outcome for this time is that the effort is to make these targets measurable. So they're, they're aspirational and they're, very, very challenging, um, the, many of the goals, but at least this time we can actually measure them. Whereas last time it seems like, as you said, the ACHI targets, very challenging to, to measure, especially on sort of an objective basis across time, across the country, across the planet rather. Um, and so tell me how, like, what's, what's different now? I mean, you say they're measurable, but what does that really mean sort of on the ground or maybe not on the ground, but, uh, on the computer, which is basically where these things end up getting measured and displayed on on the dashboards you're talking about. Yeah, exactly. Well, well, the the, the fear going into this COP in Montreal was that we were going to end up with a set of targets that were basically word salads, because um, in many cases that's what happened in 2010. And the reason was is that uh, there was disagreement on the text for those targets. And so to reach compromise, they basically threw words in uh, to the point where many of those targets became meaningless and unmeasurable. This time around, and, and partly due to the pandemic, paradoxically, we had more time to really think through how to formulate those targets, how to make them measurable, how to carefully word them, because what we need is we need nations to translate those targets to national targets in a consistent way. And as part of that, this time around, as opposed to last time, we now have adopted a set of indicators, what we call headline indicators, that each nation is going to be on the hook for using to report on progress. And this is where our dashboards come in, because we need to actually equip nations with, with the tools um, to actually visualize on the fly how they're doing, how they're making progress, and do that in a very consistent and transparent way, and where we see uh problems we can start to do those course corrections but you need that dynamic data visualization in order to be able to do that right so i want to come back to indicators and measuring and displaying that information um, in part because uh, that's something that nature serve does uh, under your guidance um, but i want to not forget to ask about one other thing which is there's nearly 200 parties at this um convention or party to the convention. And um, one of the key groups that has been emphasized and given more voice recently, which was not the case in the past, were indigenous communities. And I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, what that means and what their role was and how they were able to be um, incorporated more fully into the decision-making process. Sure. Yeah. So so I think there's a, there's there's a growing recognition and you know it's 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 not perfect by any means but we're getting better as we go of the essential nature that indigenous peoples and communities play in conservation um we have a we have a target of 30% protection of of land and seas around the planet 
that might be pretty easy where I live in Canada to do, but it's really challenging in many parts of the world where you have many, many people. So we have to think very creatively about what protection means. And so part of that is what they call OECMs. This is another sort of UN speak jargon, which basically just stands for other effective conservation measures and indigenous organizations and communities are key on the front lines for that because we know that lands that are occupied and managed by indigenous people tend to have much better conservation outcomes so they are key players in this and i'll give you an example uh in canada on the first day of of the meetings in montreal canada announced 800 million dollars uh for uh indigenous led conservation programs which will manage yeah. over 1 million square kilometers of canada um, and that will help us achieve our targets. So we're not necessarily just thinking about those traditional parks um, that you might think of as like Yellowstone and, and others, but we're thinking more creatively about how do we actually protect and conserve, but allow people to actually operate on those landscapes. That's really exciting. Um, and another thing that we've been talking uh, a bit about at NatureServe is, you know, we talk about being a science-based organization. One of those contributors to the science is is knowledge so it's really we're talking about solid science and knowledge-based decision making and a lot of that um, knowledge comes from indigenous communities and their understanding of the interactions of humans and the way that the um, habitats operate on the ground and so i think it's really exciting that this is being recognized uh, at the at the highest levels absolutely absolutely and part of that is that we're looking to see how we can bring um, that knowledge system into some of the, the the data systems that are being used. So it's that sort of what we call two ways of knowing the sort of scientific and the traditional ecological knowledge. And uh, in my previous work in the Arctic, um, the people that were living on the land with with generational knowledge of of how these ecosystems operated were were key to how we monitor and understand change. And also those folks are out on the land throughout all the seasons and they're seeing change in a way that scientists can't so they really do play a, a key role and there's more recognition of that and we need to start to figure out ways that we can actually bring that information in, in a safe and respectful way into uh, how we guide progress towards these conservation targets yeah that's great and so important um, so I want to come back to um, another one of the targets. Uh, this is the target that's probably the one that's nearest and dearest to, to the heart of NatureServe. Uh, it's target number four. And it says, ensure urgent management actions to halt human-induced extinction of known threatened species and for the recovery and conservation of species to significantly reduce ex the extinction risk, as well as maintain and restore genetic diversity. Um, and this is a native and wild and domestic species, and we're talking about in situ, so out in nature, and ex situ, so in uh, botanic gardens and zoos, as I, uh, right? Um, yeah. yeah. To try and reduce the extinction rate. Now, one of the hardest things to do, right, is to prove a negative, if you even can. And to prove a negative, you have to prove that something doesn't exist, and that means to prove something's extinct, you sort of have to prove this negative, which is very challenging. So this target to me, while I think about the most important one there, and if we achieve that, we will have achieved all the other ones as well, because the only way we're gonna reduce or eliminate extinction is by protecting large swaths of land and things like that. Um, but like, how, how are we gonna measure this? How are, we gonna, how are we gonna actually go back and say in 10 years at the next meeting, yes, we were successful and here's how we can demonstrate that. Yeah, so it's a great question, and it's it's a real challenge because because and and you touched on it when you measure extinction risk, there's a huge lag effect. So it's a little bit like climate change. No matter if we stopped emitting CO two today, we've already baked in some change into the system. The same goes if we stop felling all our the forests. Right word as it gets warmer, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> and uh, it's the same that goes for extinction risk. So they call that extinction debt. So we, we know that there are things that are going downhill um, due to past activities. But having said that, we, we talk about bending the curve of biodiversity loss. And you got to start somewhere, and, and, and that is today. We have to start today. And we have uh, two indicators under Target 4 that are headline indicators that really 
uh, guide the way. And one's the red list index. And the red list index is a famous indicator um, that uh, IUCN and BirdLife created. Um, we, NatureServe, are part of the Red List Partnership. We provide core data into that through our assessment of species. And that looks at changes in the aggregate change of extinction risk across broad taxonomic groups. So that's going to be the measure by which we determine whether we are basically turning the dial down or the pressure on these species over time. Um, the other one is actually one that NatureServe was heavily involved in. Um, we scrambled and published a paper in three weeks, which is a, a record for me. And that was on the genetic diversity side of things. And that one, we're looking at uh, effective population size. This is a way, a very simple indicator where countries are asked to basically measure the population size of 100 populations in their country, which most countries can do. Mm -hmm. And we can use that as a proxy to determine whether we are losing or holding or, or, or maintaining genetic diversity. So those two indicators are really core to target for. And, and especially on the Red List Index, NatureServe is front and square, uh, a key contributor to that. That's so interesting. The genetic diversity one is going to be really fun to watch. Um, and actually, one of the things that's exciting about the Red List Index and the related thing that NatureServe does, which are conservation status ranks, which we do for species that exist in North America, um, is that they are replicable. They are based on a methodology and two different people could go in and look at the information and come to the same conclusion. As challenging as it is sometimes to integrate data that's some of it's hard, you know, spatially explicit and based on hard counts and some of it's a little bit more uh, qualitative, shall we say. Um, but because of the methodology, we're able to get replicable results. And that's that's really great because that allows us to, to measure this. And so what I wanted to do there is transition to talking about specifically the work that you do with indicators nationally, internationally, globally, and, and what that work means and how that can um, help us achieve the goals uh, set out in this, uh, in this agreement. Sure. Yeah. Well, there's there's two aspects that Nature Service Biodiversity Indicators Program plays a role here, and and you know Nature Service we think of ourselves as as small but mighty, and I, I think that's a fair statement because the the UN these UN conventions uh, that the one I was just at had seventeen thousand people, but we have a presence at at these conferences. People know who we are. There's two reasons for that. One is, as I mentioned earlier, we've done when we published three papers as well as produced a technical report to the convention on um, asking the question, why? Why why do we fail to reach the Achi biodiversity targets? So we looked at things like uh, financial mechanisms, implementation conditions at the national scale, but but also how countries measure and track progress. And that's core to us. Uh, our biodiversity indicators program is all about indicators, not surprisingly. And because NatureServe has been around for over four decades, and, and, and as you often note quite correctly, we're, we're basically the first biodiversity observation network at a huge scale. And we've learned a lot. We've learned a lot on the science and technology of conservation. And now what we see is we have countries around the world and regional bodies reaching out to us asking for help. We're, we're working with the Arctic Council. We're working with the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. We're working with countries in the tropical Andes and the Caribbean, and now even more in sub-Saharan Africa. And the approach that we're taking is we want to build capacity at the national and regional scale to produce indicators and use them to track progress over time. So basically it comes down to recipes. You can almost call them cookbooks for indicators along with tools such as dashboards that they can very quickly own themselves to track progress. And then right down to identifying what are those core ingredients that you need to invest in at a national scale um, that you can use to, to track and guide progress. And that that's essentially what we do. We're doing that in Namibia, uh, we're doing that for the entire Arctic. Uh, we've done it for Southeast Asia. We're doing it for the Bahamas and elsewhere. It's so great. And it's really exciting. And people can uh, learn more about that on the NatureServe website, which is also fun. Um, so, Mike, in this conversation, you've been fairly serious. Um, we had a couple of laughs <laughs> about parties and things. But one of the things that's um, fun about actually knowing you is I know a little bit of your backstory. 
Um, Uh oh, (laughs) (laughs) it's not scary. I just think I want to I want to humanize you for everybody who's listening. Um, Tell us a little bit about um, the time that you spent living in places where very few humans have ever been. Okay. Yes. Well, I guess I, I'm sure you're referring to Northern Canada. So I, I had the the absolute privilege uh, to spend 18 years in the Yukon Territory, which is just uh, east of Alaska in, in Northwest Canada. And I learned an incredible amount up there um, and had some close calls. So I ran a species at risk and biodiversity team under the Canadian Wildlife Service. And so we spent most of our time out in the field, in small planes, helicopters, uh, you know, out counting birds, capturing birds, you name it. And also working a lot with Indigenous people. So I worked a lot with the, the new Vialuit, which are the Western Arctic Inuit, as well as Gwich'in people. Um, so incredible experiences. Um, you know, I've, I've learned a lot. I, I think about those days all the time and I actually miss that, that field work aspect of what I did. You know, we think about you up there in the middle of the, what we would maybe call the hinterlands or something. Um, but you weren't in like the latest and greatest technology of tents and things, as I recall, were you not <laughs> almost living in, in animal skin housing? Well, at times, well, we certainly did. Uh, yeah, we I, we did a lot of winter trips uh, on skis and we used caribou skins um, to sleep on as pads. And actually, I would argue that is the latest technology. It's uh, <laughs> you can't beat it. There's there's no thermarest that's better than a than a caribou skin. Evolution um, produces some of the greatest things. Absolutely. Like uh, people in extreme environments are the best innovators. You know, necessity breeds invention. And uh, and I learned an incredible amount. There was a, a good friend of mine who was born in Barrow, Alaska, and a new Vialuit fellow. And when he was three years old, his family decided to move to Canada. And they walked across the Beaufort Sea f- for three years to get there, hunting and trapping along the way. And... I tell you, spending time in the land with him is incredible. Uh, what he understands and is able to observe is is light years ahead of anything I I could even I can't even touch it. So I've, I learned a lot from being up and, and living in those extreme environments. That's awesome. That's so great. So well, one last question: um, yeah. You had to at some point uh, go from probably a fairly comfortable existence in high school and college and decide to go and sleep on caribou skins and uh, deal with swarms and swarms of mosquitoes and things like that. What, what inspired you to, to make that move to sort of go from comfort into the extremes that you went to and now, you know, leading this global effort to, to measure our, um, our efforts to protect biodiversity. Oh, that's a great question. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, well, everybody always has an inspiration point, right. And, uh, I had a few, but but the one that really jumps out is my dad. My dad uh, loved to be in the bush. He was an exploration geologist and a mountaineer. So all we did as kids was was climbed mountains, whether we wanted to or not. <laughs> <laughs> there was times where I didn't, but you know that kind of ingrains in you this this sense of adventure and and the love of the outdoors and camping. And honestly, I can't get through a day without being outside. It's just. Um, my day is a failure if I'm not somehow in the forest at some point. So that really drew me um, just into the natural environment. And then I had, you know, in first year university, um, I had someone uh, who is one of the top naturalists in Canada. And actually, both him and his brother are part of uh, a part of Nature Serve. They actually do some of the status ranks. They're, they're not Nature Serve employees, but they contribute their knowledge into the status ranks. And they really open up my eyes uh, to the amazing uh, aspects of nature. You know, so I'm just generally a curious person, and they throw that in with uh, with, with the love of outdoors and and it's it's a natural fit for me for sure that's awesome well we're so excited to have you on the team and we were glad that you were uh, representing us at the conference of parties because i'm sure that it's better because of your presence there well thanks that's nice of you to say there was a 16,999 others that were really <laughs> pulling their weight there too so but thanks sean yeah well thanks uh thanks for mike for joining us today and um we look forward to following the actual progress and uh, taking a look at uh, indicators and dashboards that you're going to help create to um, monitor the world's progress towards achieving these goals. 
Absolutely. Yeah. We got to, we got to come out of the gates and running um, implementations key now. We got a good agreement, but we got to actually turn that into reality. But thank you. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Mike. Thank you for listening to the final episode of Conservation Conversations for 2022. This podcast is an incredible opportunity for those of us at NatureServe to share with you some of the amazing people that we get to work with on a regular basis who promote conservation in North America and really across the planet. You as a listener are also a promoter of conservation in North America and across the planet, and you can further that uh, support by making a donation to NatureServe. We are a nonprofit organization and we rely on donations from people like you to pursue our work. And uh, I encourage you to visit our website at natureserve.org to see the different ways that you can donate. Uh, one thing you can do is adopt a species as a present for the person in your life who has everything already. And uh, this is a really nice way to support NatureServe and to uh, pay tribute to someone that you love. We hope you're having a wonderful holiday season and please don't forget to join us in January for a new year of conservation conversations. Mm -hmm.